And he likes to be called Richard instead of Dr. Mouse. And he hates long introductions. So I was in school one day. This is Richard. He's a best for the city. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I've given lots of talks, but I always get really nervous. And I only give a good talk if you give me good feedback. So if the undergraduates fall asleep, like that's a really bad vibe, and we'll take careful attempt. No, all right, okay. But just if you tell me, smile, laugh, do something, it'll it'll make me feel better. Because Australian people feel very nervous when, when they come to North America. Now, I'm also assuming that you would have a seminar series, and Professor Jarvi would have spoken to you a lot about rat lungworm. Is that right? So I'm not going to, don't need to go over the life cycle in minute detail because you'll have known that backwards and you'll immediately reach plane three anesthesia. So, so it was a joke, like I'm supposed to laugh, laugh. That's very good, you see? That's what I've discovered. If you tell people that they can laugh, they actually do. So, I don't want to do that, and, and the thing, I'm, it's almost like taking coals to Newcastle. You actually have more of this disease than almost anywhere on the planet. The number of cases in people and probably animals is probably higher than anywhere else. So it's ironic that you've got a guy from Australia where the disease is sporadic, giving a talk to you guys that actually see a very large number of cases. But the message that I have is because I'm really proud about being a veterinarian is that veterinarians contribute to an understanding of disease pathogenesis in people and this has been known for a long time but because we live in a world where they give everything a new name they call that One Health and maybe it's even a more sexy title is Planetary Health because this is a disease where an understanding of the environment and food security has a direct interface with the pathophysiology of disease in human patients as well as in veterinary patients. And although as a veterinarian my main job is to make sick dogs and cats better, the study of the disease in animals provides unique insights into the disease in all species. And animals in many respects are a very good sentinel for human disease. For example, with many diseases, I don't know where you were yesterday, but probably you were in New York at a conference the week before, and then you were visiting your mum in Glasgow, and then you flew off somewhere. So if you get sick and they try to work out where did she do it, there are a lot of possibilities. But if your dog got sick, it's much more likely it will be that he got the disease within three kilometres of where you live. So I just want to give that push. And the thing that you miss here in Hawaii is you don't have a vet school. And probably with your population, it's not justified. But if you had a vet school, then there's some guy like me that would be very interested in tabulating the disease that all the veterinarians would see. So I just want to tell you the Australian story of Angio through my perspective. And I'm going to very, make it very hokey. It's not going to be a highly scientific talk because it's just occurred like for the duration of my academic life. So I just want to tell you a story. Fair enough. So to do that, yeah, I'm a proud representative of veterinarians in Australia, and this is my good goatee. Now, I, I, I'm 60 years old and semi-retired. I work as a vet a couple of days every month. Most of the time I live on a farm, and that's my farm. Now, it's always good, whenever you, a guy gives a talk, the tendency is to say, I did this and I did that. Well, I, I didn't. I'm part of a very large group of people. So what, when, it, when I'm going through all of these slides, a lot of the best videos are from Terry King and Bruce Mackay. The best research was done by Julian Lunn, who's that handsome guy down, down the bottom of the corner. The first guy to discover the disease in dogs in Australia was Ken Mason. I'll tell you a bit more about him. And Madras worked with a rival group at UQ, and she's done a whole lot of work. So it's very much, it's not... My story is the story of Angio um, in Australia. So what, have you had lunch yet? So this is, this is a, a feast in, um, in Thailand. And that's also part of the feast. And um, if you eat that type of food and it's not cooked properly, then this is a human patient in, in Thailand with 
your lens, you strongly isis. And if you're a keen observer, you'll see he has strabismus. One of the eyes is off because he's got nerve six palsy. The abducens nerve is typically affected in encephalitic neurolangiostrongliosis. And that muscle pulls the eye back and to the side. So when it doesn't work, the eye swings immediately. So that sort of sets the tone about this disease. And this disease occurs in different people in different countries because of the unique features of the epidemiology of the disease as it varies all around the world. So why me? Why am I coming here? Well, yeah, this is where I normally am. I'm in the morning feeding the horses in the morning. My partner's doing a PhD. She's a cat specialist doing a PhD about horses. So we've got 42 horses. I live high up, about the same height as Volcano, where I went to for some nice walks the other day and snows about once every 20 years. So of course that's the photograph you show when when you travel overseas, and I have a great affinity for goats and alpacas and sheep and and things. So I'm a crazy nut that really loves animals a lot. And because I'm in Australia, we have some unique animal opportunities. And the, this mother has babies every year, and this is the, the baby that she is currently uh, bringing up in the, the backyard, and I breed miniature horses. And so, anyway, so I'm a crazy cat vet from Australia that lives on a farm. And the important thing before I talk about the disease in Australia is to give you a patriotic thing that some of the best work done about angiostrongolus has in the past and continues into the present to be done by people in Hawaii. So this guy, Joseph Alicata and Indrik that worked with him for a while did some amazing work. The, the, the disease was actually first documented in people in 1944. The paper was written in Japanese in the... Taiwan Medical Journal, and nobody knew that because nobody in the English language literature reads anything about Japanese. So when they found that there was this emerging epidemic of infectious disease in the Pacific after World War II, Alicata, extrapolating from work and his understanding of the literature, predicted that it was going to be due to angiostrongolus, and then proved that was to be the case, and then did a number of classical parasitology experiments where he got the infectious L3 larvae out of the snails and gave them to rats and guinea pigs and pigs and chickens and a whole variety of species. So a whole... The, the, the conceptual framework of neural angiostrongliosis has been generated in Hawaii. So it's important that I, you know, compliment you guys, because I'm only giving the Australian perspective. And so this was a fellow that worked with um, Alicata with one of the, the rat papers. And this here is a beautiful photo. This is a great big pulmonary artery. See all the red blood cells? And these are all of the nematodes sitting in the pulmonary artery. Massive obstruction to the right ventricular outflow tract. And nobody ever thinks about that because that's why the rats that don't so well. They've got lung work, they have reduced exercise tolerance, they have a reduced lifespan, they have an increased respiratory rate. That's a spectacular pathology. The life cycle I won't go over, because I'm sure you've had so many lectures, you know it backwards. But it was funny, I was doing a field trip in Laos, where this disease has recently been found. Um, and this is um, a table in one of the markets, and the whole life cycle was to be found somewhere on the table. <laughs> so you can see here, I don't, you know, they have, there's a rat, very tasty, some nice snails, and you know, the monitor lizards that also have the host. So the whole life cycle is actually on display um, in the thing. And of course, if you go to Thailand, Tha the whole disease in Thailand and La Laos and, and um, Myanmar, what used to be Burma, is all based on another introduced snail called the apple snail. And it's widely used for facial cream. So this is one of my colleagues, Stephen State, painting at the advertisement for, for that. And so here, there's a preoccupation with the semi-slug, the most important snail, whereas in Thailand, the apple snail is the problem. And today, we were out hunting with um, Professor Jarvie's PhD student who's sitting just there, who went to the Avengers with me yesterday. We're both devastated by the ending and have to wait for a year. He's, 
These are all these sites of plastic all around the campus where he's collecting eggs. And these are the eggs of, put that slide in especially for you, of, of the apple snail. If you go around in Thailand, you can see the little creeks, these pink, salmon pink snails everywhere. Anyway, so that's just like a general introduction. If you were a group of veterinarians, you would want to know what the clinical manifestations of the disease are. You would have heard what the disease features are in people. In people, the disease can vary from a mild disease where you have a really bad headache and a stiff neck for three weeks and you get better if you take Panadol to a disease that will kill a baby. So the disease features in, in people are very wide. I'm going to tell you about the disease as we see it in dogs in Australia. So this is a, a dog. One sec. That has mild neural angiostrongliasis. Now, we're testing its proprioceptive positioning. They should reposition the leg really quickly. And we're supporting the dog because it's a little bit weak in the back legs. Now we're feeling for pain on the back. A little bit, they shouldn't put their thing down. Now we're seeing how we're hopping, but picking up by the back end causes pain. Now this is a Labrador cross and they should be really nice. Whoop. So that's the canine equivalent of a nuchal rigidity. The dog has meningitis affecting the cord or equine at the back part of the spinal cord. Neurological function, pretty good. Very mild paraparesis. Very mild proprioceptive ataxia. The main feature is hyperesthesia. So this patient, as long as we treat it in the right way, is likely to do really well. Mild case. Very syndromic. If you have seen the disease before, if you have a high index of suspicion, if the dog has peripherally eosinophilia, you see a dog like that, there aren't very many things in a young dog, and young dogs are disproportionately affected because young dogs like to do crazy things and eat everything, okay? Because they like to put things in their mouth and squash them down and see what they taste like. And if they don't like it, they'll vomit it up. So young dogs make up a, a very disproportionately large number of the cases. So this dog is substantially worse, although I think you will appreciate that it has many of the same signs. Now, it can't get up by itself. It's got severe paraparesis or paraplegia, as you might say. With support, you can see the front leg looks pretty good, the head control looks pretty good. It doesn't know where its back legs are in space, it's got proprioceptive ataxia and it's non-ambulatory paraplegia. Okay, it's also got spinal hyperesthesia, but can you appreciate it's much worse. And this dog probably will do fine with treatment, but it's substantially worse than the other. Some dogs are even worse and the paralysis extends to the front legs, so they become tetraplegic, okay? But, what about these dogs? There could be two dogs here. Black Labrador. Looks like it's a bit painful. Yes, a bit lame. Not so good on the back legs, a little bit sore on the front legs, but clearly worse on the back legs. Proprioceptive deficits. That's me when I was young. Doesn't know where his back legs are in space. Just leaves them sitting there. Lots of truncal sway, which is a neurological test, and hyporeflexia. Now, the dogs in the other videos had normal to increase segmental spinal reflexes. Patellar reflexes were normal to increased. Do you think this dog's got angio? You. <laughs> you. Do you think this dog has angio? This guy is an MD. Yes or no? Uh, yes. No. Okay. This dog looks very happy. The other dog looked really uncomfortable. Its back legs don't work quite properly. They look a bit stiffer than normal. They're also hyporeflexic, no patellar reflex. And he sticks it out. I don't, you know, many dogs, but not many dogs stick their legs out with hyperextensor tone. But he looks a pretty happy little guy. 
on, wake up. And we treated him, but not for Angio, because these two dogs don't have Angio. And I want to show you what he's like after treatment. So you can see what a fantastic vet I am. <laughs> now, it's not quite normal because he's still bunny hopping with the back leg. There's a little bit of persistent neurological dysfunction. Okay, so he's still a boxer, unfortunately. The brain transplant was unsuccessful. <laughs> At least you're laughing at my jokes. If nothing else, they may need to get no content, but they're getting some, you know. So it, it's just an interesting thing. There are only two diseases that commonly cause neurological dysfunction based on the back legs in young dogs. Angiostrongliasis. And those two dogs had neosporosis. Now, I checked up with um, Professor Jarvie's veterinary contacts here, and also on Honolulu, when we know that disease is here, at least in your cattle population. It's an api complex in protozoa, so we're still sticking on our parasitology theme. It's like toxoplasmosis in cats. The definitive host is the dog, and normally the definitive host only has mild diarrhoea, but young dogs, particularly boxers and Labradors, get neospora and has a predilection to the back end of the spinal cord. So it's a very important distinction for us. Clinically, the difference is dogs with neural angiostrongliasis, the pain is the big feature. They tend to be hyperesthetic. And if you test spinal reflexes, they tend to be normal to increased. Whereas neosporosis usually doesn't have pain and the reflexes are greatly diminuted. The first disease we treat with glucocorticosteroids the second protozoal disease we treat with um, trimethyl from sulfur and pyrimethamine. So it's really important for veterinarians to distinguish between the two because if you treat them the other way around, if you give glucocorticosteroids to a dog with a protozoal infection, it basically becomes a neurological cripple. And if you don't give a dog with neural angiostrongliasis prednisolone, then its clinical signs, if they're severe, tend to progress. So it's very hard, unless you're a vet and can do some spinal reflex testing, to be sure. But an experienced person can, can often pick them apart. The other thing that's really important is to show you the disease in wildlife, because in Australia, rat lungworm disease extends on a very broad range of species, not just dogs and people, but a whole range of species. And the animal that is worse affected with disease that is invariably irreversible is the tawny frogmouth, which is a beautiful owl or jay-like bird. And this is an affected tawny frogmouth. Now, the person doing the examination is Derek Spielman, who's a wildlife and zoo vet that teaches vet pathology at Sydney Uni, and he's a friend. He's done everything he can do, and he's on Sunday, instead of having a day off, he has a wildlife clinic, and so he's examining this dog there. And you'll basically see this animal doesn't have control of its legs or its wings. He's just checking it to make sure there's not a wing fracture or anything like that, and then he'll do some basic neurological testing as best you can with a wild bird. These are normally a beautiful bird. They're nocturnal. They catch um, rats and mice and moths, if you drive in the, the bush in Australia at night, you see them swoop down in front of the car light to get moths from your car. They have stealth technology. But this guy, he's finished. They can't do anything. They literally fall out of the trees. And then people bring them into veterinarians. And, you know, cutting to the chase, that if you have lots of L3 larvae of Angiostrongus cantonensis migrating through your spinal cord, and your spinal cord is about the thickness of a match, it doesn't take very many of them to completely destroy it. So the impact on an animal with, that is small is always greater than the impact of an animal that's large. And birds, if you plucked all their feathers, you're only talking about an animal that weighs 600 grams. So their spinal cord and vertebral columns are really small. And you see, I, I find this a tragedy and no treatment will make this animal better. Okay. So now what I want to, I'm going to try to talk quicker because I have the capacity to talk for about four hours if you give me the chance, just to show you what's happened to this disease um, in, in my lifetime.
And for me, the story starts with Josephine Macaris, who was a scientist that became a doctor that married another doctor. And they got together as a couple during World War II, so they both enlisted in the army, and they both put them in research themes. So during the army, they made amazing contributions to malaria. More Australians died of malaria than Japanese bullets um, during World War II, and these people worked at um, drug therapy to prevent people getting it and using DEET to stop being beaten by mosquitoes. So she r reached the rank of captain in the Australian Army during World War II. And then this husband and wife team, a little bit like this husband and wife team, continued um, research and the highest parasitology prize in Australia is named after them. The thing that's really interesting if you're a scholar is this is the granddaughter of Bancroft, the Bancroft that discovered the cause of elephantiasis. So there's actually three generations of world-class parasitologists in this family. And that's for you to pay attention to, Lizzie, the next generation of overachieving. No, it's all right. OK. So she did this work in Australia, looking at the life cycle of what they thought was acantonensis. And it's well worth reading the paper, which is freely available on the internet, because it is a classic paper of early physiology doing meticulous dissection and histopathology. The only irony was she wasn't actually studying a cantonensis. She studied a thing that was later named in her honour, which is the type of angiostronglus we've always had in Australia. So we've always had what is now called angiostronglus macaraceae, and it tends to live in Rattus fusipes, the common bush rat in Australia. Cantonensis got to Australia probably after World War II, possibly due to the action of the, the Imperial Japanese Army as it moved around the Pacific. So when she did this work, the life cycles are so similar, it doesn't matter, it doesn't interfere with the science. But these guys have much got smaller spicules and a smaller anogenital reflex and slightly different mitochondrial DNA. But it just, this was studied not because the disease in humans was known, but just because it was in, intrinsically interesting. It's a terrific example of curiosity-based research. And the first paper by her was in Nature, a letter to Nature, because of the unique property of this organism having an obligatory migratory phrase through the central nervous system. Now, it was easier to get a letter in Nature in 1954 than it is now, but it still was a darn hard thing to do. So I, you need to know the quality of the work. And this is a paper from, a, a picture from one of Alicata's papers showing how the African land snail has moved around by the Japanese army. They used as a food supply as they invaded a number of countries coming down to Papua New Guinea and Australia. And it's either this or the migration of rats that explains the distribution of the, of the thing. And you see the arrow heading to the northern part of Australia, to Brisbane. And this is a map that doesn't project very well of the current distribution of anjo that roughly fits in with that. Next part of the story was this paper by a guy whose name is so difficult to pronounce I can't say it, but he was the one that noticed the difference between angiocatenensis and a, a macarensi. So that was 1968 in the Journal of Parasitology. And then in 1971, the first human cases in Australia. So I couldn't, they haven't got an archive of this paper. They won't make PDFs because it's so old. But it's a very short note about people getting human larval meningitis after eating stuff on lettuce. And they talked in 1971 about having eight cases over the last eight years. The first one may be going back to 1959. So there's no history in Australia of this disease being present before 1959. The first documented case was in 1971. And in 1972, Ken Mason, guy holding the one-eyed dog in the corner, he was a Young vet, he's about 10 years older than me, he's now in retirement. He had a really strong interest in neurology, so he made a whole lot of contributions to veterinary neurology early in his career. And he did this as a master's thesis while he was working as a veterinarian in practice. So in 1972, he saw the case of the first papers published in 1976. So the people came first, but the dogs came really quickly 
um, afterwards. And then he did a whole lot of research, including inoculation of puppies and studying the pathology and looking at the CSF findings and looking at the effect of anthelmintic therapy versus glucocorticoid therapy. All of his work while he worked in practice. Now, the interesting thing is Ken had a really bad injury when he was a kid. He injured his neck in the gymnasium and he was unable to continue with his neurological career because it involved bending down all of the time and kneeling and doing testing on dogs. So he became a specialist veterinary dermatologist and he made the most popular medicated veterinary shampoo in the world and a shitload of money. Okay, and his daughter became a veterinarian and she continues to run the company that he has that makes all of those things. So I just want you to know these are all real people, but he made this big contribution about angio and he still comes to meetings and um, talks about his work. In 1978, we have the first wildlife case in Australia. Ross McKenzie is a veterinary pathologist who is main, now, now mainly known for his work on toxic plants and the pathology they produce. But early in his career, he wrote a paper about this Bennett's wallaby, a redneck wallaby, having paralysis. And he did a post-mortem and could find the larvae. So 1971 in people. 72 in dogs, 1978 Bennett's Wallaby. And in 1987, the first baby dying. And this was um, written up by Paul Provlick, and I'll talk a little bit more about him later. So we see how the disease evolves and changes. And so far, all of the cases have been seen exclusively in Queensland, in the north part of Australia, an area where the organism was more likely to go in because it wants to be a tropical organism. It, it grew in Southeast Asia. So Brisbane makes sense. And then me and David Church were lucky enough, or unlucky enough, to, we didn't discover, but we just tripped over the first couple of cases in Sydney. We didn't know what they are. They're dogs like this, but much worse, that had failed all testing. It was not on our radar that they, we could have got angio in Sydney. We thought that was a disease on north of the border. But these were the first two dogs in 1989 and 1999, and 91 seen in Sydney. And just to give you a feel, it's about 1,200 kilometres from Brisbane, where the first cases were all seen, and southeast Queensland, to get down to Australia. And that's interesting, because we don't know whether they moved with rats, whether they were moved with snails, or whether they moved by themselves, or whether they were translocated by vehicles. None of those things are known. But over, you know... 20 years, 1,200 kilometres, gives you a feel for it. At the moment, the geographical range for Anjo is at Jarvis Bay, which is about 150 kilometres south of Sydney. It's never been seen further south than that, and the modellers predict it's too cold to continue um, in that area. In 1991, Dick Wright, who now teaches veterinary anatomy at the University of Queensland, described two folds with Anjo, and they were folds that got paralysed. And again, I don't know if you have a parasitological background, but there are strong gyles in horses that have a predilection to migrate through the nervous system, particularly strong gyles vulgaris. Now, it's almost been eradicated by the modern anthelmintics we use, like ivermectin and moxidectin. But way back in 1991, that's what Dick thought they were going to have. But he followed it through and they did larval dissections, and these were angiocatonensis. And I'm told you have horses in Hawaii with this disease, and they've also been reported in the southern states of North America. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Because horses graze at pasture. And so it's, not, it's quite possible that while they're munching some grass, they usually munch a snail or a slug at the same time. That's all right. In 1997, it started to pop up in captive zoo animals. I had a lovely day this morning at the zoo here. I can't pronounce the name of, of, of the place. Yeah, I'll never pronounce it. I, I'm, 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 I'm ignorant in five languages. But it, it's... it's um, it's a terrific zoo, and zoos are always one of the first places for this disease because you have captive animals, particularly birds, they tend to be messy with their food. They're messy with the food, and it attracts rats. And the rats are the key thing. The snails might be the vector, but it's the rats that are important. And if you want to control this disease in a zoological garden, rat control is, is the critical thing. And so now we have a whole lot of it popping up in wildlife and in zoo animals. But this first case, which was seen by Damien Higgins, who's now a colleague of mine at Sydney Uni, is a koala expert. He came in through the zoo medicine thing. And John Mackey, who's a very well-known pathologist, these were Queensland cases. So we have this in the, the betongs, which are little sort of like jumping, hopping marsupial ice or rats or whatever you call them. 
then popping up in tamarins, and the tamarins here at the zoo were affected as the first animal, because they actually like to eat snails as part of their thing, in Queensland in 1998, and then bats. Now, we have fruit bats, macrobats. Um, bats that are large, have big eyes, stereoscopic vision, and eat fruit. And you could easily see that in eating fruit, there are a whole lot of terrestrial slugs that are present that will be crawling over the hard-eaten figs that they're eating. So, 1999, interestingly, in Sydney, Leslie Redcliffe, Terry Bellamy, and Bill Hartley, who's the most famous pathologist we've ever had in, this, in, in the, the veterinary world in, in Sydney, no longer alive, and now in Sydney in 2001, the first human case. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to go quickly, but I just, if you want to really understand the disease and see how it's moved from Queensland down to New South Wales and how it's been seen in domesticated animals, captive animals, wild animals, as well as human patients, it really, it becomes a nicer story if you see all the different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle come together. And Pam Konechny was the senior author on this paper, and her son wants to be a vet, and I arranged for him to work in a friend's veterinary practice about a month ago. The thing about Australia is, we might seem like a big country, but there's not many of us there, so we're really good at networking. And the good thing is the vets and the doctors actually get on really well together. And that's another part of the story. So Paul Prodlick and Melissa Carlyle, they're the only people I know that have actually improved their health because of this disease. Because Paul's wife died tragically and Melissa had just gone divorced. She was a veterinary pathologist and they got together as a couple and Paul said Melissa saved his life and they got together because of Angio, because they were involved. She was doing the veterinary pathology for, for all of the cases. So they wrote... He's very strong in parasitology. He made enormous contributions about hookworm disease in people and in animals and, and bats and things. Uh, uh, an internist, a doctor that did internal medicine training that then went to do a PhD in parasitology. So he was a really good guy. More flying foxes, this time in Queensland. And again, then we make um, another impression because we kept on seeing the disease in New South Wales and it kept on becoming more common. But Julian had the foresight to involve Rogan Lee, and Rogan Lee is a veterinary pathologist that works as a hospital scientist. And Rogan has developed and maintained an ELISA that lets us confirm the presence of angiostrongolus. Because up until that point in time, we only presumed they had angiostrongolus. We knew for sure if we did a post-mortem examination, and we, this was in the pre-PCR era, Normally, we would say if it had eosinophilic plasitosis in the CSF, that's good enough to call it angio. But now we could confirm it um, using ELISA. So that was a contribution. And Julian wanted to train to be a surgeon, so he took this on as a master's thesis. Now in 2005, in New South Wales, two different birds. Talked before about the tawny frog mouth there with a nice little mouse in his beak. But that's a yellow-tailed black cockatoo. And they're a fruit-eating and a seed-eating bird. So again, it's spilling over into wildlife. This is Julian's thesis done around this period. And the map just shows the range of cases in Sydney. And the only thing you can take away from that, this is a sporadic disease. You know, We'd get, at that stage, three or four cases every year. But there wasn't a big cluster in one area. It's really over a very wide geographic area. 2010, another human case. And this is the commonest history of people in, in our country. It's really stupid people. Australians drink a lot of beer, okay? So you're at a party, typically a Bucks night party. You know, it's a ceremony for guys about to be, become married and become servants for the rest of their life. And so they're one last night, they drink a lot of beer. And, and they always say, you know, I dare you to drink a slug. And then really bad things happen. So this has been a feature. Most of the adult cases in Australia have been people that have deliberately eaten snails for a dare with beer. So this was the first one in 2010. This is a very good paper about rats and the diseases they harbour. This is Julian writing up his master's thesis that really involved all of the different veterinarians in Sydney. These cases are often seen by veterinary neurologists or veterinary specialists at least at the beginning before people knew how to commonly diagnose it. So we shared that experience. And this is a particularly, 2013 was a very black year for Anjo in Sydney. 
although it's nothing, it pales into comparison to what you have in Hawaii. But this guy was a young lawyer, very bright man, very good at football, drunk, a slug with beer. And he was in a coma for a year, had the best treatment in one of the best tertiary referral hospitals in Sydney. And he is functional as a human being, but he's not a shadow on what he used to be. And so I, I know there are many arguments about aspects of this disease, but this disease is not a mild disease. If you have a large number of larvae, it's a very serious disease. And it's really bad that people do it for such a trivial reason as they're getting drunk at, at a party. And in the same year, two babies died. Now, we have had a history of babies dying first in Brisbane, but there's nothing that becomes more emotive than a beautiful child that's a year age. The parents don't look at it for for half a minute, and then they find it with a snail in its mouth. And so these were two babies. One survived blind with neurological deficits comparable to having cerebral palsy. The other died. And again, this is at Westmead, the best kids' hospital we have in Sydney. They would have spent over a million dollars trying to save both of those babies on each patient, the best possible outcome ventilating kids for a month. So it's an important disease. And um, it tends to be much milder in dogs than it is in people. And its effects are far more devastating in babies and tawny frogmouths than they are in canine patients. Then this was a really unusual paper, again by John Mackey, the really good veterinary pathologist. And it shows that the importance of studying wildlife disease. If, if a wild animal dies and you just bury it, you learn nothing. But these guys didn't do it. So this was the black firing fox that somebody you know, couldn't roost anymore on the ground. They brought it to a vet who took it to the uni, so they did a good post-mortem. And they found this macrobat was infected not by Androstrangus cantonensis, the virulent form that you know about, but this milder form that we've had in Australia probably for thousands and millions of years, Androstrangus macarensi. And the really interesting thing was the infection was patent. So not only did it have the L3 larvae devastating the central nervous system, they went forward to L4s and L5s, went back to the pulmonary arteries, and produced L1 in the faeces. Now that's really unusual, and it suggests something about the evolutionary importance of bats and their relationship to rodents that's well above my pay grade. Then we saw in 2013 the disease in gangang cockatoos, just another parrot species, and somebody would say, oh, well, right, right, it's another species, but gangangs eat different food to tawny frogmouths to yellow-tailed black cockatoo. So people that are experts in avian biology can appreciate better the importance of what happens when different species get those infections. Derek then wrote up his tawny frogmouths and possums, and possums get severe hind limb paralysis that's irreparable. And then the guys at the University of Queensland that traditionally would be the enemy, but they did a whole lot of work looking at the early um, lifestyle and the molecular biology. And they wrote a, a review article. We did uh, a PCR survey of rodents in Australia with UTS and a whole lot of people there, including um, Joel. And then we did some spatial mapping to extend Julian's thesis to look at the times of the year that animals are worst affected. And, you know, the big months is actually now... Um, April, May, June are the big months for neural angiostrongliasis. We looked at the spatial clustering to try to understand it better and there wasn't a clear thing. Um, this guy is a brilliant lungworm parasitologist and he gave a review of all of the different wildlife conditions associated with that parasite. And um, then we wrote a really long review um, in a posh journal that brought together all of these different elements of, of anjo in Australia covering all different species. So, and just lastly, Catherine Wilkes is an interesting lady who was a veterinarian that did a public health PhD and then retrained to be an infectious disease doctor. I arranged for her to talk at our annual veterinary meeting and she presented three, three new human cases of angiostrongliasis. It's not a notifiable disease in our country, so I can't, if you ask me how many cases do you get a year, I'm not sure, but probably we get between 20 and 30 dogs affected in Australia every year. And of those, probably about eight to 10 are well documented with CSF and confirmation by ELISA or PCR, and the others are presumptive diagnosis based on response to treatment. So in terms of this disease, we want to do everything. We want to have improved diagnostic methods. We want to have better strategies for management. We want to have new 
strategies to prevent disease occurring, because it's always better to prevent a disease than to have to treat it. And in animals, at least, this is actually really easy to do. And we also want to develop modelling and mapping to, pre to predict how we'll this do in the future. So I've already I sort of preempted myself by putting the videos right at the beginning. So these are just all photos of animals, the ones down the bottom from Ken's original study. And certain breeds tend to be overrepresented, probably because they just have more propensity to eat snails than others. The disease is apparently more common in animals than man in Australia. I'm not sure whether it's the same here too. Later on this afternoon I get to talk to all the veterinarians and then I'll have an appreciation of how many animal cases. But that's really interesting. We've gone through the videos, I've talked about the neurological signs. One really interesting feature is in almost all animals it is a disease that affects the back legs first. And that's not the feature of the disease in people. And the reasons why aren't clear, but they were clear, it was clear from the early work by Al Carter when he first set a thousand larvae to nine research dogs. And when he studied them, their signs were just like the spontaneous disease. And when he did post-mortems, the distribution of L3 larvae was disproportionately affecting the spinal cord, especially the cauda equina, in the dog compared to both man and the rat. And that pattern of predominant cauda equina, caudal spinal cord involvement, has been a feature of all of these veterinary studies that we've talked about. And the reasons why have not been um, characterised, and, and it's, it's a, a fruitful area of research. In terms of diagnosis, even with the best facilities of the world, it can be a frustrating disease to diagnose. The trouble is that the damage is caused in part by the mechanical effect of L3 larvae burrowing through the spinal cord and then molting and releasing their cuticular antigen. Combined with the florid eosinophilic inflammatory response of the host. So there are two components of the disease, one due to mechanical damage and one due to inflammation, and so you need to consider both those things in treating them. And the difficulty is, at a particular point in time of the infection, you might not have yet developed antibodies in the CSF. You might not have enough DNA in the CSF to be detected even with an exquisitely sensitive real-time PCR. So in people, they found cases where they haven't known what's wrong. They've done a, a lumbar tap and got CSF. It's been antibody negative. Eosinophils are present. It's PCR negative. They don't know what it is. Viral meningitis is much more common in people than neural and gastrongliosis. So they send off for a whole lot of serologies and PCRs. And then sometimes they will re-tap the patient a week later because he hasn't got better. And now antibodies will be positive and there'll be a demonstrable um, nucleic acid can be picked up by real-time PCR. But by that stage, you're already a week late in terms of the treatment. So sometimes just the clinical suspicion of eosinophilic plastitosis is enough to justify treatment. So clearly we want to diagnose that better. Um, there's a new test that's a lateral flow antigen test that's been developed in China. I can't find anything about it. Normally we just rely on CSF. In animals to collect CSF, you can't do it conscious. You have to give them general anesthesia. And we tend to collect from the cisterna magna just behind the head rather from, from the lumbar system. So it's, it ends up being quite expensive and invasive and not completely without risk to collect CSF to make a diagnosis. But when you do, most of the cells are eosinophilic and that's straightforward. The ELISA in our hands has been incredibly helpful. So 80% um, of the time that produces a good result. Necropsy, well, you can see the larvae, but by that stage it's too late. So we don't like that. And so far in our hands with a PCR that's been adopted by a commercial veterinary laboratory, it's been helpful in about 30% of cases. Probably it's just a matter of if you kept on getting sequential think things should get the answer. Talked about the wildlife cases that are too sad. It's just a little bit too bright to see the damage in the spinal cord, but there's marked 
this is all inflammatory response and a couple of worm profiles. The brush-tailed possums can't use their back legs and are paralyzed and need to be put to sleep. This is the cerebellum from a brush-tailed possum with lots of nematode profiles and lots of um, inflammation. Here you go. You don't often get one in such lovely longitudinal section. Treatment always stirs up a little bit of controversy in the human area, in the veterinary area. I don't mind having my opinion, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm right. There is no doubt when you treat these patients and they have exquisitely sore back, and frequently they try to bite you, um, they're hard to manage when you're putting an intravenous catheter, the dog's trying to bite you, so you need to put a muzzle or sedate it or give it narcotic analgesia. As soon as you give them glucocorticosteroids, dexamethasone or methylprednisolone or whichever one you choose, usually there is an unambiguous and dramatic improvement in the pain within 12 hours, and usually they are walking much better within two to three days. So it's a no-brainer that they get glucocorticosteroids. You can only argue over dexamethasone versus prednisolone and so forth and so on. I personally believe in killing the larvae, but after 24 to 48 hours of glucocorticoid therapy, my rationale is the larvae, when they start migrating, are very small. And as they grow through the nervous system, they become larger and larger, both in their girth and in their length. So their ability to do mechanical damage increases over time. So to just say we're going to dampen down the inflammation and we'll wait for them to die slowly because they're in the wrong host is not good enough for me. So I give heavy glucocorticoid therapy and then use either moxidectin or fenbendazole to kill the worms. And probably fenbendazole is better because it kills them more slowly. Fenbendazole is the veterinary version of albendazole if you're a human pharmacologist. Um, but we often use moxidectin because you can apply it with a transdermal preparation and sometimes opening these dogs may have to give them medication it isn't necessarily so easy. But I believe that they do better by combining glucocorticosteroids with killing the larvae. And the majority of medical cases have been treated in Australia, in tertiary referral centres over the last five years, have used some sort of anthelmintic therapy to kill a larvae. So at least in my country, there are many people that share that view. There's one unusual thing that we discovered by accident, but it's not without precedence. And I won't go into the reasons why, because I'll use too much time, but some of these animals are bacteremic at the same time. So if you do a blood culture when they're very sick, in fact, it was because a veterinarian couldn't decide, he thought that the dog might have vertebral osteomyelitis, discospondylitis, or angio, and he couldn't decide, so he did a blood culture in the CSF. And the CSF was full of eosinophils, and the blood culture was positive for E. coli. And the phenomenology goes something like this. I thought you would laugh, but it didn't happen. It, it's a well-known phenomenology for, for parasitologists. It occurs with a number of avian um, nematodes. When you have a gastrointestinal parasite that's going through the gut, they eat and ingest anything they can find. So serum is their preferred food. They'll gobble up E. coli and Klebsiella and Pseudomonas and whatever is just sitting there. It's all part of the stuff that they're gobbling up. And the stuff goes through their alimentary tract and they poo it out. So if you have an organism so I didn't, it went through the life cycle. What, what happens in the dog is you get ingested L3s. They go through the gut wall. That causes gastritis, and usually they vomit and have a little bit of diarrhoea. It's a prodomal syndrome before they're affected. Then it goes from the stomach and the portal circulation to the liver and then the systemic circulation, and effectively you have parasitemia, except the parasitemia brings enteric bacteria with it. So we always recommend broad-spectrum coverage with doxycycline or moxicillin clavulinate or something that is good for enteric gram-negative organisms to give in at the same time. Because we're giving them a massive dose of glucocorticosteroid, so if you don't do something to treat the bacteremia, maybe something bad will happen. So that's another feature um, of our treatment. We're very interested in the epidemiology and how it's changing over time. It's become harder to track because ironically, educating veterinarians in the disease means now people diagnose it in general practice rather than sending it to a veterinary specialist 
a neurologist or an internist or something. And the people that diagnose and practice treat the cases, but they don't often collect CSF. So it's actually really hard to document how many cases are seen in a city with a population of 4.5 million people, which is what Sydney is at the moment. Um, I think we know why the disease is so coastal, because it's a very rat-related disease. And, and Rattus, Rattus and Rattus Norwegians in Australia have a very strong coastal distribution. Peter Banks has shown that with his epidemiological studies of rats. The good news is this is a very preventable disease, okay? Because you have an incubation period that Joseph Alicata found was 11 days, and Ken Mason found the same thing. So from when the animal eats the slug or snail, it's going to take 11 days before the larvae get to the central nervous system and produce eosinophilic meningitis. So if, for example, your dog, whoever you are, Came, you said, my dog's just eaten three semi-slugs. They were on its spoon. It ate the whole lot in one go. I would say, oh, don't worry. You can give fenbendazole, albendazole, mabendazole, ivermectin, moxidectin, and you will kill all of those larvae as they're migrating through the stomach wall and the liver well before they get to the central nervous system. And most of these drugs cross the blood and barrier, so they'll work there as well too. So that's happened if, if, if you knew that an event happened. If you just live in Hawaii and you have no idea what your dog does all day because you're working 40 hours a day for the head of department or head of discipline or whatever she is, as I'm sure you are, she beats a whip. Do you know why they're so productive in Scotland? It's because the sun never shines, so they're always in the lab. <laughs> but, but, so you don't know. So how can you protect the dog? Now, if you gave it fenbendazole, that won't work because its half-life's only seven hours. If you gave it ivermectin, it won't work because it's all gone after a day. So you need to have a drug that will kill migrating nematode larvae for three to four weeks. And the drug is moxidectin. So the first generation ivermectin, then came milbamycin, and then the next generation was moxidectin. The advantage of moxidectin is a very long half-life. Now, at the moment, it's a veterinary drug, but it's being developed as a human drug to treat onchocerciasis and scabies. So it will eventually be, be available for people. But it's already available for animals in a variety of forms. The most common one is it's mixed up with imidacloprimid. Imidacloprimid is a thing that kills fleas. Moxidectin kills internal parasites, so it gets rid of your roundworms, your whipworms, and prevents all nematode infections. And its half-life, I can't remember the half-life, but it produces effective blood levels for about three weeks. So there's a disease in the United Kingdom and Europe caused by Angiostrongylus bazorum, the dog lugworm. And to prevent dogs getting dog lugworm, they've shown that Advocate, with moxidectin, given every four weeks, stops them getting the infection. If you were really worried, I would probably give it every three weeks. Okay, the drug is not especially expensive. We also have it as a yearly injection in a depot lipid formulation in Australia. And although I doubt you, you get, this prevents dogs getting heartworm for a year, which is a filarial nematode that you have here and we have, and it's present all through Southeast Asia and North America. It, it produces effective levels of moxidectin sufficient to prevent heartworm for a year. But I suspect that if you gave an injection of that before the peak season in Australia, it'd probably work, work for three or four months. But for whatever way, moxidectin is your friend. Um, and if, and I'm not allowed to say this really, but I'll be gone soon so it doesn't matter, if they make moxidectin for large animals. And when you make it for large animals, you can buy it by the gallon and it's as cheap as dirt. So one of the things I do is I do One Health work in Aboriginal communities controlling um, scabies and fleas and diseases in dogs in Aboriginal communities. And so we get the cattle formulation of Cydectin and you get 10 mils and you squirt it down the back of a dog. It's got a blue dye in it so you can work out which cows you've treated. And it costs pennies. So there are ways that people, even from socioeconomically deprived areas, can give their animal in a cost-effective way moxidectin. The drug is off-patent and freely available, and it'll be available in large animals. You know, there's a transdermal form that's absorbed through the skin, and there's an oral form that's used as a drench. But there's definitely um, a way to do it. I don't need to talk about public health issues, because Sue's done a ton of work about that. 
Um, but I think I'm largely um, done. There's one more thing I mentioned and really come out of conversations that Sue and I have had talking about other different things. The normal way you think about disease prevention in this scenario would be, we've got to get the snails, right? And so you can try to get every snail in Hawaii. You had enough people in prison? No, it's all right. I, but so so that, it's really difficult to do that. You can debulk an area, but the semi-slug, like, there's, they're under every building. I've been, Sue's got them breeding here everywhere. We're collecting their eggs and doing experiments. So, so that's not so good. So a more effective way might be to remember that the key thing about this is the rat. So normally we say, well, if the problem's rats, let's kill all the buggers, okay? And so we use anticoagulant rodenticides, and usually they're warfarin-like molecules, third-generation compounds that interfere with coagulation. So we try to kill all the rats, and I'm sure there are bait stations somewhere around this university. There are usually bait stations around. But the trouble with just killing them is you will kill a certain proportion, but there will always be some rats left. We're just not diligent enough to do that. A thing that might be far more effective in this scenario is to combine a strategy of killing the rats with treating the rats with moxidectin. So that it's really easy to get something tasty, some dog food and some peanut butter and whatever you had for lunch today, and you mix it up all together, and you get a bit of moxidectin, you mix it all in, and you put it out there, and the rats are going to eat that. If they have a heavy burden of angio, they're actually likely to die, because all of the worms in the right ventricular outflow tract are going to die and form a pulmonary embolus, and that's the end of the rat. But if they have a mild burden, it will kill the worms and they will embolise and the animal will then need to be reinfected by eating some more snails. So if you put out a moxidectin bait around areas where there are a lot of rats at airports or ports or around a farmhouse or in a zoo, you have something probably in the long term likely to be far more effective and maybe you could hybridise it. But this is certainly an idea we're keen to... to to look at. So treating the definitive host rather than not. Just some stuff about the um, oxidectin being used in human patients. And I won't talk about that. And thank you so much for listening. <clears throat> Questions from an interested audience. You, how could a clinician like you not know the difference between an acne complex and protozoan? Need to take you to veterinary school in Australia. Correct? 11 days. It's in dogs. It's different in people. It's different in rats. It's different in every species. In the rat, they can get to the central nervous system within eight hours. Okay? You've got to see these guys under the microscope. You've got to go to the Javi lab. You've never seen, like, they, they swim so vigorously. They have a tough cuticle. They can penetrate through anything. So in the rat, you know, you do these experiments. You get 100 rats. You give them light on it. He's doing it at the moment. You, you do light anesthesia, you do gastric lavage and put a thousand larvae in, and then you kill a rat every, or five rats, every one hour, two hours, four hours, and you see where they are. That's what that lady, Josephine McCarris, did. Um, in the dog, it's very different. It takes much longer. Eleven days before they show spinal signs. Why does it take longer? Because the dog is not... The definitive host. These larvae over a millennia have learned to live in the rat, so they go quicker because they've adapted. And interestingly, they produce less inflammation. And the rats do not become symptomatic neurologically as a larvae migrate through the nervous system because they don't get a florid eosinophilic response except for very large numbers. And also, rats are small, so the distance that a larvae that's a certain length is smaller and finite. So, of course, it's more quickly in a rat than a person. But why is it 11 days in the dog? I don't know, because it's not the definitive host. If you feed it to a pig or a chicken, they don't get disease. The larvae become arrested in the tissues before it gets there. If you give them to a guinea pig, they don't get to the nervous system. Every species has a differential susceptibility to the larvae. 
And this is a feature of many pathogens. TB will be cause disease in one animal and, and, and not in another. So your question's really good. But it's a very crisp answer because it's such an easy experiment. You get as many dogs as you want, you give them a hundred larvae, a thousand larvae, ten thousand larvae, you look at what clinical signs they get, you examine them every day and you collect CSF or blood or whatever you want. So that's the answer. Australian one. You've only got Cantonensis. And I'm not sure I understand the rest of the question. So basically, this older study they said they had five weeks within eight hours, and then two weeks, it would have. Yep, 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 yep. And then it's left the central nervous system, it's back in the lungs. So yep. What's the most approximate time, I guess, the juice for a human based on that age? We no, 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 that's a bad. Never to juice it based on animal. What you need to do is to use some of those prisoners that you have in the in the jail, or if you can't find them, then you use a simian primate or something that's a close facsimile. Or you look at the case studies where the known infection was related to an antecedent event. So if somebody goes to the Bucks party on the 14th of January, that's when they got it. You know, they didn't get it the day before because that's un you're only stupid enough to, to eat a snail when you're drunk. So there are many, many cases in Southeast Asia where they can relate it. A whole lot of people went to a restaurant and they all had fresh snails. So you would need to do a meta-analysis of papers and look at the literature and backtrack the time. Probably dose would have an effect. And the other thing that makes it complicated is the immunological experience of the host will determine a whole lot of things. Now, if you are in Southeast Asia and you live in a Thai village, you probably will have had some hookworm and probably some whipworm, maybe a bit of pinworm. And those metazoan antigens have a lot of cross-reaction with cantonensis. So you will have made some antibodies and some cell-mediated responses that are protective. Right. But if you live in a pristine environment like an apartment in Manhattan, then you are not going to be exposed to those range of things. So the disease you're likely to get is going to be greater and you're going to have to so I'm trying to say it's a really complicated system but extrapolating no we shouldn't do that now extrapolating is dangerous often you can find in the literature there's information that would help you're a smart guy I can see you thinking but no prize yes 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 I don't I I don't see primates as part of my practice but I'm Pretty certain I can remember studies in macaque monkeys. I don't know how far they've gone. It's unlikely they would have gone to chimpanzees or, or orangutans or something like that. But the higher you get along the primates, the more likely it is. They're very susceptible. In zoos, it's usually the small um, subhuman primates that are first affected. They're very curious. They're very intelligent. They've got opposing fingers. I like to put everything in their mouth. They pick up snails and eat them as part of their normal diet. But, but like... It's doable if people are interested, and but that, it's like it's a doable experiment. Uh, first one is, what would be the first clinical sign you see your dog? The first thing they do is they vomit, because when they eat the larvae, they migrate through the stomach wall and they produce the eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Now, dogs vomit for a hundred thousand reasons, you know, they eat what you had for dinner last night, they ate the cat's poo, like, but the first thing they do is they vomit, right? And then a couple of days later, they develop the neurological signs. And the first thing usually is pain, change of behaviour. There's one more thing I should say, it just made me think of something I should have said earlier. Sometimes we disclose subclinical disease in dogs. So say a dog picks up a low burden of anjo, it eats it, snail crushes it, gets a few larvae, spits it out. And it's a bit off. And the truth is, we're not so good observers about our dogs, we might, oh, it doesn't look right. Okay. But if you have a dog like that, and then you give it its monthly worming, which is usually ivermectin, selamectin, or moxidectin, 
So you kill the small number of migrating larvae that just make you feel a bit off. Suddenly, then they present with florid signs of angio with a really sore back and hind limb paresis. Because you didn't know they were subclinically infected. You didn't know the larvae were migrating. And you just gave what we consider a normal monthly anthelmintic. And your timing was just unlucky. And they actually go really well with therapy because as soon as you give them glucocorticosteroids, you've already killed the worms. They've, they're dead. The cuticular antigen and the cytoplasmic antigen have all been exposed. So if you dampen down the inflammation, they bounce back and they get better much quicker. And so I, I just went off on a tangent because I should have said that earlier. But, but it's hard as an owner. If, if I owned a dog in Hawaii, I would be using Advocate every three weeks. I wouldn't think about it. Where I would get it from, well, that's a negotiation. But, 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 but um, um, it's very safe. It's been widely used. It's been shown to be effective. It's what I use for all the horses in my farm to stop them getting worms. It's what everybody uses for cattle. Like, you know, it was an interesting drug in veterinary medicine 20 years ago when it was new. This is why we take it for granted. We've moved on to new classes of anthelmintics that work in different ways. So... I, I am passionate about that because I, I, I do think in the it's easier in, like you guys aren't going to take the drug. It's more of a problem in your kids, but 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 for dogs, not a problem. Cats are really interesting. If I go back to your question, they try to produce. Alicata gave gave larvae in three different doses to cats, and in all cases, the cats vomited within five minutes of being given the larvae. Couldn't produce the disease with an oral dose. That's because cats are smarter than dogs. But he gave the larvae as a subcutaneous injection, and then they get classical angio just like the dog gets. But there's been no spontaneous disease in cats, and it's just interesting. I don't know why they must get the larvae must, for some reason, be irritant. And that's the beauty of veterinary medicine or comparative medicine or One Health or things like that. It's you get really interested in why. One species gets it and the other doesn't. Why it's more severe in one and not in the other. Oh, no, come on. Don't I get a rest? Look, I'm well over time. I've got another talk at six I need to prepare. The answer is yes, but they've done those experiments. So they've given dogs angio, they've looked at the signs, and they've waited six months, and they've done it again. And it all depends on the time course. But the thing about immunity to parasitic disease as a generalisation is it definitely occurs, and it's both antibody-mediated and cell-mediated, and they've characterised it to quite a refined extent. But it doesn't persist without constant exposure. Right? So, so if you're exposed all of the time, if you've got rats and you gave them a small number of larvae, now rats, remember, they don't get neurological signs, they just get it in their lungs, but they develop immunity to the, 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 the worms they have in their lungs, and eventually they'll kill some of them, they'll die, the worms have a finite lifespan. Now, if that happens all the time and they only get a small number of larvae, they're not likely to pick up a heavy burden, even though they continue to eat lots of mollusks. And this is what occurs in nature, because a good parasite doesn't kill its host. That's a really bad strategy. You just want to make him, you want to make him happy and keep on going so you can continue to live inside and continue the life cycle. So a little bit of exposure is helpful, but it's not reliable. Moxidectin? Yeah. Just use a heartworm medication that has moxidectin in it. Oh, that was just I'm doing like everybody should be asking now, did Bayer pay for his airfare to Hawaii? Is he having a massage tonight? You know, are they taking him to the casino tomorrow? But I don't have shares in, in any of the companies. Um, but you can choose. It's simple. It just means make a choice. Use a heartworm preventative and a flea preventative because most of them have got two or three products rolled in together. Pick one that has moxidectin and don't give it every month. Give it every three weeks 
and then be happy. <laughs> but if you tell me the people in Kuna aren't, can't afford that, and you've got to realize that these companies make a fortune because the moxidectin costs about 20 cents and they sell the packet at costs $50. And the imidacloprimid, which is really good for fleas, if you go to the garden store and you use it for spraying aphids, right, it, it's a fraction of the cost. It's like, here's the scale. If it's for the garden, it's cheap. If it's for the veterinary medicine here, and if it's for people, it costs a fortune. Okay? I don't mind, like, if you can find a veterinarian or intelligent person that can calibrate and get the doses right, and you buy the cattle product, it's really cheap. But for you as a normal consumer, if you've only got one dog, and you know, you're an incredibly well-paid university academic, um, it shouldn't be a problem. I'm not a wealthy academic. Now, can I go and have a rest now? Is that all right? Thank you for all your questions and stuff.